Okay, it's live streaming and recording. So. Is everybody admitted? Should I start? Yeah, you can start. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so, good evening, good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, and welcome to the second open seminar. So, uh, Thomas is returning here in uh, uh, this format of the open seminars uh, to speak for the second time uh, before uh, we uh, just a second before uh, uh, we move on to his topic and give the floor to Thomas. Let me just present uh, briefly the, the, the project of uh, the School of Materialist Research. Uh, so the School of Materialist Research, SMR, is an education and research uh, collective uh, that offers intensive study courses, seminars, special programs, uh, research initiatives that address the materialisms running through contemporary science, philosophy, art, mathematics, design, architecture, and politics. SMR was founded by the Center for Philosophical Technologies at Arizona State University. Uh, the Institute of Social Sciences and Humanities, Skopje, the Department for uh, Architecture, Theory, and Philosophy of uh, uh, Technics at the Technical University of Vienna, and the Critical Inquiry, Inquiry Lab at the Design Academy in Eindhoven, the Netherlands, and serves as a global hub for education, research, and experimentation at the intersection of the humanities, social sciences, creative fields, and the STEM sciences. So briefly uh, about uh, Thomas and uh, he will present, uh, I, I don't want to take too much of your time uh, in, uh, by presenting the uh, abstract of the talk as well. Uh, he will do it uh, himself. Uh, I'll just present him. Uh, he's par part of our, uh, well, kind of uh, the permanent or uh, uh, returning, recurring uh, faculty. He he has been te uh, he has taught uh, twice uh, in the frameworks of the intensive study uh, courses that are uh, European credits. Uh, transfer system uh, certificate courses uh, of informal graduate uh, education. Uh, so he, he's going to teach uh, another such course uh, next fall. Uh, and it revolves mainly around the topic that uh, he will be talking about uh, tonight. Uh, and now very briefly his bio and I'll give the floor to him. So Thomas Nail is a professor of philosophy at the University of Denver and author of numerous books, including The Figure of the Migrant, Theory of the Border, Marx in Motion, Theory of the Image, Theory of the Object, Theory of the Earth, uh, Lucretius 1, 2, and 3, Retur uh, Returning to Revolution and Being and Motion. His research focuses on the philosophy of movement. Uh, Anil has in, uh, uh, is interested in developing a philosophy of movement. Uh, you may know him by uh, his concept of kinetic, uh, kinetic, kinetic materialism. His work combines the insights of uh, process philosophy and new materialism to develop a unique uh, kinetic philosophy. His methodology is motivated by pressing contemporary concerns and deeply rooted in historical and empirical research. And there is more info on him on our website. Um, uh, now I give the floor to uh, Thomas. Thanks, Katerina. Thanks everybody for uh, for watching the video and 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 showing up for the live stream. Um, yeah, it's nice to be back. It's nice to to be giving another uh, another talk. So this one, as Katerina is saying, so this is going to be on the topic of life, death, and the kino scene. And I'll define what the kino scene is in a moment. Um, the uh, uh, I'm going to just share the screen here um, for the lecture slides.
Okay. So yeah, this is, this is, this is, this is the topic, um, life, death, and the keynote scene. Um, this, uh, is, this lecture is part of a larger, um, book project. So this is, this is material that is, um, discussed. Um, although this is a very condensed version of what's discussed in my book, Theory of the Earth. Um, the book, Theory of the Earth, goes through a lot of different, um, aspects of the history of the earth, uh, not all of which I will talk about today. Um, I'm going to talk about the latter part of the book um, on climate change, um, life, death, extinction. Um, but the book goes through the origins of the universe, the history of the earth, origins of life, theory of evolution. Uh, and then the last section of the book is on theories of climate change. So that's what I'm talking about today um, is climate change um, and the contemporary Anthropocene slash Kenocene. There's a million problems we could talk about with this term Anthropocene. Um, and so, and there's lots of different uh, scenes. So I just wanna sort of add in one more idea about uh, one of the features. There's so many scenes, they all characterize different features of the contemporary period. Um, and I think one of those features is movement. Um, but I'll say a little bit of that about that in a second, but we should first start with this idea of what I'm calling the Holocene assumption. Um, and there's this wonderful quote by uh, George Bataille that I love. He says, all that we recognize as truth is necessarily linked to the error represented by the stationary earth. Um, and this to me is an, is an interesting way to think about how so many uh, humans, obviously not all of them have thought about the earth, um, especially in the European Western tradition, the earth is thought about as a kind of relatively stable stationary thing that humans then do stuff on top of. Uh, most of those humans in that tradition never thought for a second that they would that their actions would be able to destabilize um, something as stationary as the earth itself. Not only is it a foundation um, for human action, it's a foundation for human thinking. The whole idea of philosophical quests for foundations is kind of modeled on this image of the stationary earth, but the earth isn't stationary, uh, not just in the sense that it, uh, you know, moves around the sun and, you know, moves, but also that it itself changes and is metamorphic. Um, so the idea of philosophical or geophilosophical foundations um, is just, it's a kind of regional uh, moment in earth history. Um, and so that's why I'm sort of showing this image here up at the top. This is not even that long ago, this is just really since the Cambrian uh, period, uh, about 500 million years ago, you can see that uh, the earth, even in just the last 500 million years has gone through a lot of different phases uh, in temperature changes. Um, this is not to say that humans aren't causing anthrop anthropogenic climate change. This is just to say that we're not dealing with a stationary earth. We never have been for lots of reasons that are above and beyond uh, anthropogenic climate change. We've never been dealing with one, but if you look at the very end of the, 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 the diagram there, you can see, um, Katerina, can you see, okay, the end of the diagram on mine, it's like the column of video screens is kind of blocking it, but I'm not sure if that is for everybody else. Yeah, it's the, at the very to... end. You can you see the be able full to see screen. everything. Yeah, you can oh, see awesome. everything. Okay, great. Yeah. So for me, I can't see it, but for you all, you should be able to see it. So at the very end there, you can see that red line is tracing through uh, the blue squiggly line right toward the end. That is the Holocene period. That's a period where temperatures sort of plateau off more or less um, and become stabilized. Um, that is a period where uh, the vast majority of human history has existed is in this Holocene. And the human experience for a very long time has been one in which the, cl the climatic situation is relatively stable. But this is, it's a kind of geo-historical anomaly. Um, and there's lots of reasons and, and, and things that go into making this period stable. Uh, part of the, one of those is the Gaia hypothesis, which is that the origins of, of life are, um, they're, they're, that life itself produces a metastable state. It produces changes in the world that then make it more possible for life to survive. So life regulates uh, the temperatures that so on, the, on the planet such that it's more conducive for life. In any case, the idea, this stability, it's a regional stability. It's a historical stability. It's absolutely not universal. It's not a historical. There's no reason to believe that this will continue forever or that it had continued in the past. Um, it's, it's a kind of, it's a moment of geo, geological history, but we've taken it to be some kind of absolute assumption about the nature of the earth. 
Um, no longer, of course, right? Um, so you can look back in theories about the earth, you can look back and see that um, in, in, in myths, in ancient myths and understandings, especially the classic classical period, there's lots of stories about a stable earth, um, uh, especially classical Greece philosophy, Greek philosophy, the idea of a kind of cosmic sphere. And then the earth is sort of at the center, this very stable point, the sphere rotates, but the center remains exactly static. Um, it's not really till the 1960s that you get any significant changes in the ideas. And that's a very long time for humans in the Western tradition to be thinking about the earth as a pretty stable place, um, uh, as a foundation of, of, of sorts. Plate tectonics in the 1960s definitely, you know, changed that idea um, in thinking about floating, that rock was sort of floating on an ocean of magma, um, moving around. That's some degree of instability, but it does, doesn't sort of undercut the idea of, in geology, what's called uniformitarianism. The idea is that there is, there is, of course, there's change on the Earth, but the idea is this is kind of a linear change. It's slow. Geological change is incremental. Little bit by little bit, things do change. Um, this is, for a very long time in geology, even though geology is not that old as a science, um, that, has been, um, that has been a prevailing assumption that change is kind of linear. Um, with very recent data um, in climactic modeling and Earth temperature changes, we know that it's not linear. We know that the changes of Earth's temperatures are nonlinear. They go through phases of, of relative stability and then sudden moments of instability. You can see on the diagram above the Cambrian around you know, 300 million years ago, uh, we have really dramatic shifts in temperature. Um, that also are coordinated with mass extinction periods. So, but you know, these changes are related to a million things going on. Um, they're not linear um, or predictable in, in, in ways that a lot of geologists have thought. Now let's talk about the, the Kino scene. Um, so yeah, I've just kind of made up this word to describe one, one feature. Uh, to me, I think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big feature of what's going on. If you think about the world geologically, um, is the Anthropocene the best term to talk about what's happening right now? I think the answer is no, for a million reasons that a lot of other scholars have pointed out. One is it's kind of grandiose to call it the Anthropocene, um, at like because it gives an entire geological epoch to humans. That's a little bit uh, chauvinistic on the part of humans. Even if it's them that's causing the problem, they were the ones that could cause the problem, and they're the solution to the very problem that they posed. They not only define geology, destroy geology and then save geology. It's a very human centric, anthropocentric way of thinking about things. I mean, furthermore, it's also just like, it's not really all humans. Not all humans caused global climate change. A very small portion of humans caused climate change. Not all humans are affected equally by climate change. The ones who caused it are disproportionately unaffected and the rest of the people who hadn't are disproportionately affected by the climate change. Anyway, I could go on, there's lots of problems. But here's a non-anthropocentric way to think about geologically what's going on right now. What's going on now, if you think about what a geological strata is, it is layers of material. Classically, this has been like rock, uh, minerals. But we could think about this in a much broader way, uh, that uh, the sediment is anything that just literally sediments into the ground. It doesn't have to be mineral. It doesn't have to be rock. Um, if you think about the kinds of things that are happening now, we have layers of plastic, of uranium, of all kinds of metal waste, all kinds of industrial waste, um, chemicals. Uh, we humans have produced new geological strata um, that will be sedimented for a very long time and some of them for shorter periods of time. But the point is, if you look at the, just the quantity, the mass of material, of geological material, because it all at some point came out of the earth, airplanes flying through the sky, little bits of metal floating around the Earth's orbit uh, in space, right? I mean, that is, there's a layer. There is, it's not even on the Earth necessarily, but if you think about the layers of the Earth, there is a layer which is just hundreds of thousands of pieces of metal floating around the Earth. That's a sort of layer um, that wasn't there historically. Um, if you think about human beings in planes, in boats, uh, in just human movement around the planet, the shipping and distribution of plant materials, of minerals, of technologies, of various goods, the sheer movement of materials 
uh, around the world is is unprecedented. There's no other time in geological history where you see this much of this many different kinds of geological strata material floating around very rapidly, um, around, circulating around the earth. So one way to define what's happening now is just by a certain, a sort of kinetic uh, frequency of just like huge distributions of really quick materials moving around. Now that's like very much a bird's eye view of if you looked geologically, you would see all this geological material flying around that we call human culture. Um, enormous amounts of migration, both human and animal. Over half the species of, of, of animals and plants on the earth right now are in migration. They are having to move because of climate change. So climate change is producing a huge movement. Now this movement is, it's dramatic, we're living through it. Um, it is both a sign of something very unstable that's happening, but it's also a kind of recognition or it can be, uh, is would be my point about the keynote scene. It can be a place where we can stop and be like, whoa, everything is moving around everything has always been moving around. We are not dealing with a stable system here. We are dealing with an unstable, non-linear system um, and we should treat it like that and stop treating it like a stable, linear process uh, that, we, that we're not somehow not participating in. Okay, so here's just you know an example of what uh, the definition of linear versus non-linear. Linear would be just that horizontal, or not horizontal, but that, uh, that angular line um, you can see that it's just additive, one plus one plus one plus one. In a nonlinear system, the changes are recursive and there's feedback loops in which there's a qualitative shift, something dramatic uh, can happen in the system. So even though you see in the area what we observe there on the left, everything looks, if you look at it on a very small scale and a very short time period, everything looks very linear. So you can look at the Holocene and be like, look, linear change. Um, and what we're witnessing now with uh, climate change is a nonlinear uh, result of feedback systems. If you destroy half the trees on the planet, you're going to get some really dramatic uh, results. One way to think also about the Earth system as a, is as a metastable system. Metastability is not strictly stable, but it's not strictly unstable either. It's momentarily, temporarily stable given a whole bunch of inputs that maintain that stability. That is a much better description for thinking about earth systems as metastable systems and not as stable or as just some fundamentally chaotic or random. They're not random, uh, but they're not stable either. They're metastable. So the image in the upper right, uh, that little, if you imagine, this is like an energy curve. Um, if the energy remains within a certain region, that's the little bowl that's holding the one. If the energy remains in a relatively stable place, then one can move that ball circle, can move back and forth within that dip, um, uh, and it can look relatively stable. Um, but if you push it past a certain point, it doesn't, it doesn't just slightly go up or down, it goes dramatically down. Um, and that is uh, a nonlinear change in a metastable system. The new system moves to a new metastable state. Okay, the Gaia hypothesis I was mentioning is that Earth systems create that metastability. So living organisms release all kinds of gases, decompose parts of the Earth. They transform the atmosphere. They transform uh, what we call the biosphere, the, the, all of the life that goes into maintaining the planet. Um, is accomplished through the process of dissipation. And by dissipation, I just mean the breaking down of energy. The way that, for example, a plant would absorb sunlight uh, and convert it into ATP um, and release various gases and fluids uh, as a result of that, it is taking a, a higher energy and breaking it down into smaller pieces. That's what life is doing on the planet. That's what the whole cosmos is doing. Um, but that's the way in which those gases, those liquids uh, end up back in the atmosphere uh, and then recycled through um, living systems. If you think about a complex ecological system, there's layers of, of really diverse organisms that at each stage break down the waste products of the previous larger organisms. Um, so, one another way to think about metastable systems in Earth history. So the diagram in the bottom here, this graph is a um, uh, a mapping over uh, Earth's history of sort of temperature changes, and the little stars, white stars, there are ice ages. P 
periods of time, you can see that there's a kind of iterative cycle of um, cold cycles in Earth's history. This has nothing to do with anthropogenic uh, climate change. This is just partly how the Earth works, uh, not just in the solar system, but the solar system works inside the larger uh, Milky Way system. So we are on a specific arm in the Milky Way. Many of these patterns, they're not, you know, they're not identical, but they're iterative enough that they happen in cycles uh, that are related to the Earth's position uh, in the solar system and in the Milky Way. Um, are these kind of 100,000 year cycles of glaciation uh, related to the Earth's eccentric orbit. So the Earth is not a circle around the sun. The Earth is not even a perfect oval or ellipse around the sun. The Earth rotates differently around the sun every time, slightly differently, slightly differently. And every 100,000 years, it's just enough that it produces um, these really cold periods and then back into warm periods again. Anyway, not only is the Earth not stable, the solar system is not a stable solar system either. All the orbits are eccentric, uh, meaning they have a kind of fundamental instability to them. Okay, so let's talk about dissipation. This is the big picture of life and death. Um, in if the Kino scene is this moment that that we're undergoing, what is the bigger picture in which that's happening to us? Um, and what lessons can we learn um, about where we're at? How to survive? Uh, how to live through uh, the 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 Kino scene? Um, I think it, it recalls for a bigger perspective about what's going on uh, in the cosmos, but also just energy systems at the Earth level. Um, we tend to think about things as in terms of conservation. Everybody's heard that a lot, that we're conserving. We need to conserve energy because we're using too much. Um, conservation, it's just not, I mean, maybe in the strictly physical sense of the first law of thermodynamics conservation, but that's not what we're talking about. Conservation as like the preservation, the accumulation of energy of storing, hoarding, and rationing out energy. It's just not the way that the universe works. I mean, it's just not the way that energy and entropy work in the rest of the universe. There's no reason to think that humans are somehow special that they're going to achieve and that conservation is their best way to survive. Their best way, human's best way to survive and the cosmos' best way to survive to keep doing what it's doing. Some of the longest lasting systems are highly dissipative systems, meaning systems that are uh, metastable that are releasing quite a lot of energy. They are breaking themselves down very rapidly. And by breaking themselves down rapidly, they sustain a certain pattern. Now that's very abstract. Let me give you some examples. One would be the Milky, or not the Milky Way, but uh, the uh, our galaxy, right? So the, yeah, the Milky Way galaxy. It's a giant spiral circling around a black hole. It's the constant process of destruction, the black hole destroying our galaxy that gives it its spiral turn. And that spiral turn is precisely what is keeping everything together and stabilizing everything rotating around it. Now, eventually we'll all, our whole galaxy will be swallowed by the black hole. That's not the point. The point is it maintains that form only because of a giant vortex at the center that's destroying it. So it's only through dissipation Spirals and vortices are some of the most efficient ways to dissipate energy in the cosmos. That's why you see them at pretty much every scale of reality, down to the microscopic, up through the cosmic. You see spirals and vortices because they're ways for energy to break down in a stable and efficient way. Now, um, that's what the cosmos is doing. It's moving from hot to cold everywhere at all times. There's no exception that no, anybody knows of to this a law of entropy. Um, the universe and everything in it is moving from hot to cold. There's very few things that we can say about everything in the universe, but this is one of them. This is what's going on. It's the world in which uh, our contemporary moment uh, exists. Um, and dissipation or entropy, it's just the spreading out of energy. I don't think we have to buy into these metaphysical ideas of thinking about entry, entropy in terms of randomness. That might be how some uh, physicists and mathematicians have thought about it in the 19th century. But really, it's just the spreading out of energy from hot to cold. That's what's going on. And each of these images here, so the bottom left, this is ice crystals spreading out, uh, you know, um, this is in, in these very specific patterns, these branching patterns. Um, the next picture to the right is the distribution of dark matter uh, in the cosmos. Again, it's a very uh, branchy, spider webby, uh, spreading out process that distributes the dark matter, which of course then uh, situates uh, where baryonic or visible matter will reside, like our cosmos. The next one, lightning. 
that's another great example of energy spreading out from, uh, from hot to cold, from high concentration to a low concentration. And my favorite one here on the very right is Laniakea. That is the name of our local galaxy cluster. So each one of those white dots is a galaxy, not a star, a galaxy. And the, 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 those, those lines, um, that's a modeling, uh, some astrophysicist modeled the, the direction and movement of the galaxies as they spread out in the cluster. The point in all of these images to show that there's a very similar pattern, and that is a branching pattern, like trees, like lightning, like crystals, like, uh, like galaxy clusters. At every scale, that's what's going on. Um, and that's an important starting point to think about how to survive in that kind of world. And conservation is not the answer to that question. Not, none of that has anything to do with conservation. It has to do with the metastability of dissipation. So on the left, again, is another image. That's a river delta. What's the fastest way for water to get from the mountains out to the ocean is this branching uh, fractal pattern. Uh, then in the bottom left, that is, that's my diagram of, of like a rough diagram of what's going on in the nervous system of a small animal. Energy comes in through the mouth, spreads out in all direction, branching through its toes, feet, tail, uh, and then out, uh, out the back as waste. What's going on on the earth? That's the diagram here on the right, um, mapped by total energy. So that's the vertical axis is the total energy. For example, of the sun, which you see on the graph is very high. The total energy, if we take um, the, 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 the mass of the earth is really high. There's a lot of energy in the sun. Uh, and then the horizontal axis is the rate of energy dissipation per area. So relative to the size or the area of the object, that is how much energy it can release. It can break down and dissipate. So the sun, although it has lots of energy, uh, you may be surprised to hear is not a very efficient uh, dissipator of energy. Um, there are for its size, it's absolutely enormous, but it takes millions of years for a single uh, photon to get out of the sun. From the middle of the sun to just getting out of the sun, it takes a very long time for that to happen. Uh, that's because it has to travel a very long way because the sun is enormous. I mean, once it escapes, it takes eight minutes to get here, but it takes millions of years. All the light around you right now is millions of years old. I mean, really technically billions, but at least millions as it came from the sun. As you, as you look at the earth, the mineral earth, just the rocky sort of core uh, parts of the earth, those are less, they're smaller than the sun, so they have less total energy, but they are more efficient at dissipating energy through volcanism, for instance. The earth is much more efficient than the sun um, at dissipating energy for its size. The atmosphere, again, more efficient, plants even more efficient, and animals, there are bacteria um, that are 500 times more efficient at dissipating energy than the sun is per area. They're very small, but generating ATP is a very efficient way per area um, to dissipate energy, to use it, break it down and spread it out. Because they're so small, the area is very small and the rate can be much faster of dissipating energy. A small child, I have two, they're very energetic. They are dissipating energy more, uh, more rapidly um, uh, and more efficiently per area than the sun is. So you can see what's going on in this graph. What I'm trying to show you is that um, this phrase that Dorian Sagan used, nature abhors a gradient. A gradient meaning a concentration of, of hot and cold, high energy to low energy. Nature everywhere is trying to break down that gradient. Um, it's trying to move everywhere from hot to cold as, as quickly and as stably as possible. It's not just blowing everything apart. It's like a spiral. It's the fastest way to dump water out of a bottle. Turn a bottle upside down, it just glug, 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 glug. It'll take like a full minute to empty the bottle. You give it a little spin, it'll spiral, and the water will come out very rapidly. That shows you that it's a very rapid system and it's a very stable system. It, it, it keeps it in place. In any case, um, this is what's going on everywhere. This is what's going on in the Earth system. If humans want to survive on it, we have to play this game. We have to understand the game we're playing, and we have to be able to play it well enough to live on the planet. Um, another way to think about this in a kind of different, slightly different image is this branching image here. Um, if you think about minerals, atmosphere, plants, and animals, 
Um, they decrease in their size, right? The area is decreasing, uh, but they actually increase in how rapidly they're dissipating energy, just like water coming down from the mountains starts in very big rivers and then breaks out into small tributaries and then floods out, it fans out into deltas. The same thing going on in a river system is the same thing that's going on at the earth system, same thing that's going on at the cosmic system. Uh, everywhere, this is what's happening. One more example at the level of biology. Um, you may know this or remember this trophic uh, diagram from uh, biology class in high school, um, but the sun there at the very bottom of the, uh, the, 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 the trophic structure here um, is generating all this energy at every scale. So plants and then herbivores and then uh, omnivores and carnivores, um, every stage is eating every other stage, right? Digesting the energy uh, from each of the other periods and then releasing heat. In fact, if they only each at each of these levels, um, the organisms that are eating from each from the bottom level only use one tenth of the energy uh, that they are consuming. Nine tenths of the of, of the energy at each trophic level is just wasted. I don't even mean used, like not stored uh, for any usage, not even used to reproduce the body itself, but just wasted as heat. Okay, so right now, all of us out of our heads, if we could like look at a thermo thermo sensored vision of our bodies, we would see that heat is just radiating constantly off of us. We are not, you know, we're not using that heat. That is wasted heat that we have not used. Um, I did just see actually recently a, like a bodysuit that was trying to like harness static and, you know, thermodynamic heat uh, off of human bodies to kind of try to make use of all the energy that we waste. But that's actually a very good example of the weird fetish that humans have of conserving and hoarding energy uh, instead of doing what the rest of the universe is doing, which is wasting a uh, vast majority of its energy. The, the sun, 99% of that energy is just radiating out into space. We're barely getting a little bit of that. So evolution, what is going on? If that's the case, it actually has some pretty interesting, I mean, it's definitely the case. This is, this is very obviously empirically the case about what's going on. A massive waste of energy and recycling of energy on earth. And eventually it just after being recycled many, many times on earth, the energy releases out of the earth into space. But the sun is doing that very dramatically. So at the level of evolution, this diagram on the right shows you that over time, so 500 million years, Cambrian, uh, all the way to the present, what you see is that as organisms evolve, what they are evolving to do is to dissipate more energy per square area. So not only is there a kind of material evolution of the sun, earth systems, atmosphere, uh, water, plants, in, inside of just the, the animal evolutionary uh, trajectory is a tendency to increase the rate of dissipation. So here, uh, this is uh, oxygen, uh, consuming of oxygen levels and the burning off of that oxygen. So organisms over time have uh, evolved to do this. Again, perspective about where humans are in this larger story. We are a point, we are an animal on this sequence that have developed org bodies which burn and waste energy like crazy. I mean, the nervous systems that we have, that we have so many nerves and they require a lot of energy just to sit there and not even think about anything, not even use your brain actively to think about, just zone out, your brain is using 20% of your body's total energy. That's a lot. That is the single largest organ using energy on your body and you're not even thinking about anything. You might be just sleeping and your brain is always using that much energy. Even with the difference between sleeping, not thinking, daydreaming and conscious rational thinking, minuscule in terms of energy usage. We hardly use that much more energy to think um, it is a little bit more, but it's always using that much energy. My point is nervous systems are very energetically expensive. They're very energetically wasteful. And that is the point. That is, that is how they have evolved in this larger sequence is to waste this energy. Here is, um, another point about evolution. Not only do organisms evolve to dissipate and waste energy in just increasingly? They also, I mean, by waste, I mean, it goes back into the earth and is consumed by other creatures and so on and recycled over and over until eventually it's wasted outside of the earth into space. Um, 
but the number of different types of families of animals inc has increased over time as well. So not only is there an evolution of energy usage, there is a plurality of diverse species that know how to use it and waste it and dissipate it in more unique ways. So uh, the, there are more, the more ways there are, so this is a larger perspective about what the earth is up to at an evolutionary biological level. It is there to maximize or increase the number of different species that are all also increasing uh, their ways, their ways and um, functions uh, to dissipate energy. So the earth has many ways uh, and you can see that it has evolved, especially and dramatically in the case of animals, it has evolved to diversify the number of species on the planet. Now, obviously anthropogenic climate change is decreasing the, that diversity of species. Um, and that is one of the main points. Now it's not the main point, I'm getting to the main point here. Uh, one of the, the biggest ways that humans have screwed up this process, but one of them is killing off the diversity of species. The more animals and plants that you have, the more ways there are to break down energy. Okay, let's talk about trees. We are a planet of trees. It's only relatively recently that we discovered uh, with the, with the, um, the satellites, recent satellite imaging that there, we used to think there were like, you know, millions of trees uh, or even billions of trees on the planet. But it turns out that there's trillions of trees on the planet. Um, there are 3 trillion trees on the planet now. At the beginning of the Holocene, there were 6 trillion trees uh, estimated on the planet. That is an incredible amount of trees on the planet. Um, and I'm talking about trees here because trees are also the single largest kind of biomass on the planet. Biomass, I just mean like organism, like living material. If we just looked at it as a mass, uh, we would see that trees are the largest amount of mass on the planet, um, of biomass on the planet. Now, this paragraph here has lots of, of data here um, that I have done my best to verify and double check how much energy are trees actually using? Like, what are they doing energetically on this planet? Um, first of all, you can see from the diagram that the biomass production, which is to say the energy that trees take in and then use to just reproduce their material structure to grow into a tree, you would think, oh, well, that's what trees do with energy. No, that is 1% of what trees do with energy. 99% of what trees do with energy is just radiate it out uh, just into the atmosphere. That is what the atmosphere is. It is made of those of that energy used largely by trees. Uh, transpiration of water um, and various different gases, oxygen being one of the most important. So a single tree transpiring 100 kilograms of water a day will use nearly 60 million calories. If the average tree evaporates 151,000 uh, 600 kilograms of water a year. That is nearly 88 billion calories per tree per year. Multiplied by the 3 trillion trees currently on the planet, that results in an incredible, and so 1.1 times 10 to the 24, that's 10 with 24 zeros behind it. There is a name for that. If it's, you know, that's well beyond billions or trillions or whatever, that is yada joules. Okay, so that's a yada is 24 zeros. That is an incredible amount of joules of energy. Uh, that is more than pretty much every other system, any other single system on the planet. Trees are one of the main ways that the earth as a system breaks down energy. Animals play their part, no doubt. They're very efficient, but they're relatively small. When you look at the biomass of animals, it's very tiny. I'll show you a picture. You see here plants. This is largely trees. 83% of the biomass on the planet is just trees. Even 13% is bacteria. Animals are on the bottom, right? 0.4% of biomass is animals. So animals might be very efficient, but they have a very low biomass uh, on the planet. And humans, of course, there are the 0.01% of biomass on the planet. Um, we are a very, very tiny, uh, but very, very uh, dissipative system on the planet. The problem though, is that humans, uh, that very, very tiny percentage have destroyed half of the plants and trees on the planet. So that is not a small amount of biomass that we've destroyed. Uh, you know, when I say we, of course, I mean, you know, a very small percentage of like, not even, not even me, like I haven't destroyed anything directly. I would prefer not to, uh, but we are, but this, I mean, 
this is a whole other topic, uh, but we could easily identify a kind of fossil fuel class, but also a class of capitalists that have invested and built an entire world system around this process. Okay, so 0.01% humans, and probably even a smaller percentage of that, uh, are uh, capitalist fossil fuel consuming uh, people who actually have control over how much is being, uh, how many trees are being destroyed. It's a very small percentage that has destroyed a very large percentage of biomass. Now, what does that mean energetically? I'm coming to the end here. These are the last uh, diagrams that I wanna show you uh, before concluding on some questions about ethics of life and death. At the end, um, this diagram, this this graph is um, uh, an image of the phytomass total. So this is like plant and tree totals through uh, history since 4000 BCE. Um, obviously, it goes back further, but the data I don't have the data for that. Um, this is from Vaclav Smil, um, the sort of energy theorist. He's written a ton of books keeping track of all of these energy totals for a very long time, his entire career. In any case, what you can see very quickly in this diagram is that since 4000 BCE to the present, we have uh, basically uh, humans on the planet, um, various different groups, some of them more than others, have reduced the total uh, uh, phytomass by half. Here is, you know, this is the famous hockey stick diagram. You all have seen that. This is a much shorter time period, starting with just the 1800s. So basically, rise of industrialization and capitalism. You can see that a really quick, uh, uh, there's a really quick uptake in energy consumption. Um, uh, now I've put the numbers here. You'll see I'm going to merge these two graphs. So you can see, but these numbers, you although visually you can see that the numbers have gone up really exponentially. Of and this is what you see. Like, look how much energy humans are using. We are using a lot of energy, but that's not the main point. The main point is that the way in which we have used that energy has been by destroying the biomass of the planet, by destroying the species, and primarily by destroying half the amount of trees on the planet. So it's not about energy you know, it's not about energy in principle. It's about how that's been done. I've put these in, in, in Yada jewels here be, to show you that humans, their energy consumption has gone up like a negligible amount of Yada jewels. Whereas what's going on at the planetary scale, they have, they have actually done, we should be looking instead at this, we, instead of looking at this hockey stick diagram, not that it's unimportant, but we should take a look also at what's going on on the bigger biomass picture of the planet. And that's this. You can see at the bottom, that is the level of energy, human energy and expenditure. Yeah, it's increased from 0 0.00002 to 0 0.00055. That is the human history of energy uses over the course of industrialization. The line is flat here because it doesn't even register on the level of uh, planetary energy expenditure. And that's what I want to say. Uh, and that's what I try to argue in the book is that uh, the the keynote scene is a perspective of looking about uh, looking at global movements of energy, looking at global movement and as a whole, not just looking at what humans have done. Um, that is part of the story, but it is not the only story. It's not like we're using too much; we should use less. The point is, is that we are destroying the 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 energetic systems that are sustaining the metal metastable state of the of the planet. Above the line above there, from two point four to one point zero, that is. Uh, the total energy expenditure, more or less, there's a lot of things that factor into that. But here, this is a very rough approximation based on the fact that we are dealing largely with trees as energy uh, uh, users on the planet. We have, by reducing the number of trees from 6 trillion to 3 trillion, which sounds like, oh, we still have 3 trillion. That's a lot. Well, what that has done is it effectively reduced the capacity of the entire planet to release energy by half. So we have reduced the earth's capacity to dissipate energy. And that is, that is what the earth is up to. That is what the cosmos is up to. And we have really set that back, not necessarily by the amount of energy we've used, although it's obviously related here, but by the amount of energy dissipators on the planet we have destroyed. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up here on, dis on, on the ethics. So certain human groups have expanded energy as the earth, uh, as if the earth were static. Now the idea of like, oh, we can destroy half the trees. It's a static planet, we'll be fine. No, it's a metastable system, you won't be fine. Um, and that's the source of the destabilization. That is a source of our problems. 
uh, it is also uh, one of the answers to fixing the problems um, is among many other things, uh, plant re replanting trees, um, obviously repopulating species is important, but the starting point has got to be trees. Um, the point here that I wanna make is it's not about conserving our energy um, or even reducing our energy necessarily. Like I have no idea what humans are capable of, of conserving and reducing. The point is what we're doing to the rest of the planet is, is what's important to pay attention to. So our current problem is to actually, the one way to rethink the problem of climate ethics and trying to survive on the planet is to think about it as a dissipative system. Are we helping the dissipation of the, of the planet? Are we helping uh, by giving the gift of death? helping things break down uh, even further. Trees do increase the amount of death, if we want to use that term more broadly on the planet, they are breaking things down. The more things there are, the more diversity of species, the more species, the more plants, the more, or, the more life there is, the more death there is. We need to be not only increasing the life of the planet, but also the death of the planet as well. And through the life-death cycle of dissipation, the, that is how things become stable, is by a constant influx of energy and outflux of energy, life and death being increased uh, to a, in, a, in a way that increases the total dissipation of planetary energy. Okay, how do we do this? This is, I'm at the end here of my lecture. Um, I cannot solve climate change. I'm not proposing that. I do wanna I just point out one thing. There's a million things that we could do. There's a lot of related issues. One of the things that is very important is composting in the broadest sense of what composting is. What we use, it's not, and it's not that composting is not about conservation of like, oh, save your garbage and reuse it. It's not about conserving those things. It's actually about giving the gift of death is that when you take compostable materials and give them back to the earth, you're not just giving back something and therefore equal, equalizing, you're actually increasing, you are giving birth to huge populations of bacteria. Again, not a small population of biomass on the planet. Bacteria is so important to the health of the planet. You are giving birth to that bacteria and fungus that break those things down. They live off of it. So you're giving life and that life is gonna die uh, when that source is done. So it's not just about conserving through composting. It's actually about increasing planetary dissipation by composting. Carbon sequestration is also a type of composting where carbon is brought back into, it like helps living organisms grow like trees. Those are living, living organisms, again, break down energy like trees. So they are increasing the death in the, the broad sense here. Um, the other thing is to increase diversity of all kinds. So biocultural diversity, not just the diversity of species. That is what evolution is up to, diversifying species, increasing the ways that species can break down and how quickly and efficiently they can break down energy. So that includes diversifying human cultures, diversifying ecosystems. And of course, some of those are better and worse. The point is to have a lot of different ways uh, to dissipate energy. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Okay, so it means that I kind of wrongly announced this uh, lecture as one being on your next book. It's on the theory of the earth. Um, I will uh, open the floor now uh, to the present in the Zoom room for questions, discussion, and Zach can, Zach can be checking in on the stream if there are any yep. questions yep. appearing there. Uh, okay, so does anyone want to first and um, ask a question or debate. You can just raise your hand here, you know, in the reactions but, uh, button. If you need more time, then I think I have a question, if that's okay. People can type their chat, their question into the chat yeah, too. That's yeah. that's fine. Also, I'll keep an eye on the chat. Also you can, yeah, type the questions in the chat. So you don't have to raise hands and discuss if you prefer it that way. Um, let me ask you a question. So uh, I've been thinking about uh, the following. I mean, uh, I agree with this whole logic. Uh, of uh, your kinomaterialism 
and of uh, this necessity to give the uh, gift uh, gift of death back to life in order in order to you know keep the cycle going in, in order to um yeah the cycle between life and death uh going uh in order to preserve life if you will even though as you say it will eventually life will eventually be engulfed by this dark matter and you know it will have to and uh in the form of death some sort of uh, uh an annihilation but on the other hand that will again give birth to uh other forms of life so uh and all of that is uh some kind of um logic or um laws of nature physics uh uh, whatever, perhaps there is some uh, layer of metaphysics there as well, uh, how things are and why they are as they are. And all of that uh, uh, sounds uh, very close to uh, my heart, my thinking of things. Um, yet again, I must ask um, regarding this uh, phenomenon, phenomenon of Anthropocene, let's use it for the lack of a better term uh, at the moment. So the destruction that we impose on earth, the destruction of trees that are supposed to produce this death, right? Uh, or the destruction of the animal uh, species. Uh, if conservationism is not the answer to that, then what is, according to your philosophy, the answer to that? What would be you know, the method of dealing with this destruction, which is of a different register. It's not the destruction that kind of is part of life as you presented. It's a different form of destruction. So because uh, I'll wrap up, I just want to, you know, kind of present the rationale behind my question. There is, uh, death and there is destruction that is pertaining to nature or physis in ancient, ancient Greek. And uh, there is a form of destruction that humanity uh, creates that is not in line with this uh, uh, logic, with this phenomenon, with um, if we can call it a phenomenon, how the, the, uh, the universe, uh, universe works, works as you presented it. So how do we deal with the destruction that, uh, of this different sort that we as humans impose on uh, nature, on uh, primarily on uh, plants and animals uh, uh, in order to reverse that, that process? I'm yeah, assuming yeah. you're proposing that we ought to reverse this process. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting is what's what's happening now is, it's like, it's not just destruction, it's like the destruction of destruction. Does that make sense? Like, that is what deforestation is, you know, deforestation yeah. is not just destruction. It's destruction of destruction, it won't let the ecosystem itself destroy itself. Mm -hmm. That that's the point, you know, I mean, destroy it in a stable in a meta stable way. That's what ecosystems do is they eat themselves and they waste themselves and they do it in such a way that it's 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 meta stable uh, and in a way that if just by clear cutting a forest for instance uh either by the demands of capitalism or anything else like deforestation it, it it is not the gift of death it is robbing the gift of death it is not letting it's not letting species live so that they may die it's just not even letting them live at all and I mean, just one example, you know, of, of one of the things we should stop doing and how it's connected to this very kind of weird Western metaphysical commitment to life. We think like, oh, we're, we're living and like we do things in order to live. And this is just how humans are on this planet. We have to do these. We have to destroy in order to for us to live. We have to like destroy everything else is our plastic like so much of our garbage and our plastic we have this weird metaphysics of our plastic which is we won't let it die you know if you think about it in this way it's like we've not only destroyed the earth to get the plastics we then uh like in imbue in a not in a conscious way but imbue plastic itself and our trash with this kind of immortality we buried under the earth 
and now no organism can touch it. You know, bacteria can't get to it. Uh, so it, it won't, it's gonna, it won't degrade because even things that could degrade won't degrade. You know, some biological materials, we stick them in a landfill, cover them over and oxygen can't get in there. And a lot of bacteria can't get in there. We are robbing, we are stealing the food for the bacteria and fungus by burying our trash in the ground um, and hoarding it there. We don't think about trash as like a hoard, but look, if you just bracket for a moment the way we think about it now and just look at it from a kind of geological perspective, humans are basically you know, rummaging up all this stuff like through extraction out of the earth, transforming it into like very permanent you know, or relatively permanent objects and then burying them. If you didn't know any better as a future geologist or anthropologist, you might look back and be like, they must have really valorized and buried a special burial of their trash because they wanted it to live forever, <laughs> to not degrade. I mean, the mummification, if you look, this is what humans have done for a long time in burying the dead. The whole practice of burying the dead is to like put them into the earth and preserve something about them so that they have a place to live and they have food to eat or whatever. We have buried our trash in the same way that earlier humans have buried their dead in a very, you know, in a, in a kind of sacred way so that they could, they, they remain, the ancestors remain present and not distributed all over the place, but their bones are there and the bodies are there. We have done that with our plastic and our trash and, you know, uh, you know, uh, radioactive material and waste. We've like, so we've kind of, we don't, we won't even let our waste go to waste. You know, like we're so hoarding of it, like we just can't. And I think that's one of the things we have to do is, is give back the gift of death to everything else so that the bacteria can live, but we're just not doing it. We're essentially hoarding it. Even if we're not thinking of it in that way or you know, trying to hoard our trash, we are hoarding our trash. We are taking from the earth, sealing it up in a box and keeping it from everything else to live on. So in that way, we're keeping life from living and we're keeping death from happening as well. It's like we don't wanna participate in the cycle of life and death. And indeed that's what a lot of you know, religions and metaphysics are about too, is living forever, immortality. We are trying to live out the fantasy of the metaphysics of immortality, of pure life without death. We don't want the death to happen even to our own waste, and we will live on at whatever expense. So anyway, that framework has got, that metaphysical framework of life and life centrism has got to go. It's just not what's going on in the universe. It's a very distorted anthropocentric vision of what's happening and that's got to be corrected great okay this was a great answer and also something illuminating so uh, uh i won't take uh any more time just a, a quick recap so basically what you're suggesting is uh, recycling etc uh forget about it it's more uh uh it's better for preserving the earth and actually combating uh, climate change to let plastic, for example, decay rather than recycle it or whatever. So uh, it's de uh, uh, this decay of plastic uh, in the soil of this earth is not going to damage the earth. That's what you're saying. It's going to do its own work of, you know, death bringing, life back through it. it yeah, I mean, eventually, mm -hmm. I mean, plastics, I mean, there's all kinds of waste that is relatively toxic, but there's also lots of fungus and bacteria that live off of toxic waste. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's not impossible for that to happen, but we should be careful about it. Like, can't just like, you know, do it to everything. Mm -hmm. We should be careful about what we put in there. I mean, if you put poison into the ground, like then you're, you know, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that can also be quite damaging. So we have to be thoughtful, but that starts from like, and I know it's probably the hardest, it's probably the hardest idea to shake the idea that we need to live, live with death and live in order to increase uh, the death of the planet with the expenditure of the planet. You know, I mean, and I mean, again, I'm not, I'm not proposing anything like absolutely insane. Like I just read a paper by, you know, a geologist who's like, look, the number one thing we can do to stop climate change, forget all of this technological solutions, just plant trees, like planting trees that can set us back, that can, that can reverse climate change by like 25 years. We can gain an extra 25 years at least by planting trees and we have enough space. Planting extra trees, at the, even at this stage of, of, of planetary civilization, even if we just planted trees, we have enough room without destroying, we don't have to destroy any cities to plant enough trees that would, that would do this. We've got the space, we have the resources, we could easily do it. It doesn't involve anything technological. Trees are the best, 
wisest technologies, some of the best on the planet. They are what's keeping this thing going, planting trees and letting things go to waste, uh, it composting, not just recycling, like plastics themselves. It's just not really a good model of facilitating life and death, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, there's, there's, there's a question, so. Yeah, okay. Somebody. So, um... Tom, you're well, muted. I, I, I've just unmuted, I, I hope. Are you hearing yeah. me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Um, uh, I would just say I'm quite old, so I've learned to live with death in that sense. But um, <laughs> I'm, and I'm speaking from London. Um, this is this this past uh, part of best part of an hour, I guess, is has really clarified things. I've I've been trying to catch up with your thoughts. Um, if I've got it right, you're saying we as a we we do have to do things. We have to think about how we relate to the planet, to the cosmos. We don't just let it get on with it, but we have to aid dissipation, basically. Um, one of the, I just want to confirm, Martin Hagland um, points out in, in, in an article I've read that we are different from other species in that we are the only species who have to think about our relationship with with the planet, other species have instinctive relationships. I wondered what you think of that um, approach. And the other one is 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 um, one of your. Um, you keep saying that we're not all responsible um, for the wrong things we do. It's the small class of capitalists, but we do go along with the cap what the capitalists do, and I think we do have a duty to oppose. That's the couple of points I'd like to get some comments. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, on the second point, I completely agree. I mean, we, to the degree to which, you know, the fossil fueling, fuel using classes, so that would probably be you and I, you know, in, you know, from America and the UK. I mean, we're, we're disproportionately for sure responsible in ways that, you know, huge amounts of people on this planet don't even use a fraction of the amount of energy that you and I are using even just mm -hmm. sitting here on Zoom, you know, like participating in this huge infrastructure of, you know, uh, energy usage just, just to have this conversation. So yeah, we do have an obligation, but at the same time, I think it's not quite accurate to say that like, we're of the same responsibility and caliber as, you know, the 0.01% of, of, of capitalists who are really, you know, the lobbying the state and change and, and, you know, altering policies. And like, I, I don't want to live this way. Like, and, you know, it, I don't want all of this stuff to be the way that it is. And I don't want to, I like, and I don't feel completely responsible, although you're right. It's certainly I'm, I'm receiving the benefits of it. And in that sense, should absolutely complicit um, and have a responsibility to respond against it. But I think there's like, degrees and gradations that we would really want to distinguish between people who use very little energy on this planet um, and have no say in what goes on uh, and people like you and I who probably don't really have much say in what goes on either. I mean, we could scream at the top of our lungs and write whatever we want. And there's just a level at which that's not going to that's not going to cut it. Um, but I agree for mass action is absolutely required to change this system. Like a lot of people together need to do need to need to need to change things. So in any case, there's probably a, a, a degree spectrum of responsibility and who's affected and so on that, that we want to think. So I'm with you. Uh, on the first question uh, about Martin Hagelin, yeah, I mean, uh, that's a kind of classical, I will say, my perspective on that is it's anthropocentric. Um, that is a fundamentally anthropocentric perspective. And, you know, people, maybe Martin Hagelin and, and other, other, you know, phenomenologists and people might say, you know, they might just say, well, that's just, Humans, humans just have thinking and nobody else has that. And so that's what makes us special in the universe. Um, and I don't, I, I honestly don't buy that. I think that the, 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 the distinction, it's, it's another way, even though there's degrees of how much people emphasize human uniqueness or specialness in the planet. Uh, I don't like any, any part of it because I think it, it, it's, even though it's not their intention, it is anthropocentric to say that humans are somehow unique or special um, and that uniqueness gives them some outside perspectives, such as thinking that other organisms don't have. Let me just give some examples. It's not only humans that can screw up ecosystems. Tons of different animals and plants can screw up ecosystems too. They also have to relate to the world. They have an ecosystem they have to be part of. Now, of course, they have 
they have a different set of capacities and a different set of needs that need to be met, but they can make mistakes. Trees can bloom at the wrong time because they thought it was going to be warmer than it was. That, that's an error that they made. They didn't have to bloom then. It's not a mechanism. Like They don't automatically bloom. When you look at the cycle of trees fruit, fruiting and blooming, they're very irregular. There's a, tons of variables that go into it, and they decide often as a, like in a grove of, eight of oak trees will decide together. They release pheromones together, and if there's a certain degree of like the pheromones, the chemicals are released, they will all produce fruit at the same time, huge, creating a huge mass of acorns, increasing the probability that some will grow even if people, you know, animals eat those acorns. Predators will sometimes just completely eat their prey to extinction and then die themselves because they ate all of their prey. My point is, is that every organism on this planet lives in a complex, unstable, metastable situation that they're trying to find a place in it and they have to be cautious and experiment. Try this. Did it work? Don't eat too many here. Don't eat too much of that. Now's the right time. Now's not the right time. That's how, pe that's how animals get eaten. They were in the wrong place at the wrong time. They misjudged the situation. They thought that that thought it was just a tree, turns out it was another animal, they're dead. That's, those mistakes can happen. And what they're doing is a kind of thinking. They have brains too, okay? Animals have brains, just like humans have brains. Now, they're not the same brains, they have different capacities, strengths, and abilities, but that doesn't mean they don't have brains. And it certainly, to me, doesn't mean they don't think. I think animals very obviously think, not in, I'm not saying in identically the same way as humans, but they think too. They make decisions too, and they don't always make the same decision. They're not machines. I just, I can't even tell you the number of animal studies and I can send the literature to you because uh, I teach a class on animality and, and, animal, and, and animal language and thinking and cognition and so on. The, the, the amount of data we have now about what various animals can do and what they can think mm -hmm. is vastly more than Martin Hagelin gives them credit for. I don't think there's anything, there's, there's nothing radically fundamentally unique about humans. Now that said, humans have Netflix, gerbils don't, fine. Okay, you want to say, you can, you can make up whatever arbitrary things you want to say, like humans have this, animals can't do calculus. Okay, I guess, but why'd you select that? You're just making things up such that humans then fall into a category of uniqueness just by definition, but you're the one that selected that criteria of definition. Nature doesn't have that criteria that says this is absolutely unique and somehow different than everything else, but it's also true of like, you know, hedgehogs, they're unique in a way that no other animal is like a hedgehog. Do you know what I'm saying? But like, so what? Humans are unique in ways that no other animal is. So what? It doesn't give them any special access. It doesn't give them any special problematic. We make the same mistakes that other animals do in our own way, you know? Can I say what makes yeah. humans unique in, for me is that I am one. And, and I say that not as a boast. I sort of hand up my yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah, yeah. Species who's done all this damage, you know. Um, jumping a little bit, I, 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 <laughs> I am working through Marks in Motion, and I, um, I've come to. You're, you're, you're saying, even rocks have some consciousness or, or something like that. Have I got that? I've got, have I got something? Well, wrong? I'm not saying rocks have consciousness. I'm just saying like rocks would even have a kind of agency. Agency just means oh, the capacity agency. to okay. affect, yep. to yep. affect and be affected. That's, yep. I mean, that's what's going on at every scale. There's yep. nothing in the world that affects, that isn't affected or doesn't affect. It's just, that is the relational nature of an entangled cosmos is that everything affects and is affected. I wouldn't, I don't, I mean, consciousness is, that's a, that's a whole nother topic. That is actually yeah. the next book project I'm writing on consciousness, uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> but just to, just to your, your response about um, that you are a human. Let, let me just, let me just frame it this way. Um, uh, cause, cause what you said is not unusual. I've heard this uh, many times, uh, mostly by phenomenologists who take it to be obvious that this is our starting point. Me, I'm the starting point. Where other starting point could I possibly have? I, I just am already here in this form. And, I, and this happens to be this particular form. So I'm going to look at the world in a very human way because of my human-centered thinking about the world. I don't have another center. Here's what I say in response to that is that, look, you are only partially human. Uh, you, what humanness is, is like mostly bacteria, viruses, cells, like all kinds of stuff ecosystems, environmental, like the world, you are also the world. I mean, this is part, I mean, if we wanted to go down the phenomenological route, this is what's cool about Mer Merleau-Ponty's later work is that he really takes seriously uh, the way in which the flesh that we have is also the same flesh of the world. Humans are not somehow 
oh, I'm human. No, you're also the world. That's what gives you from Ponty access to thinking about the nature of the world is because you already are the world. Now you are the world in a very specific located material way, but you also, you are the world. You're not a human in the world. You are the world in folded up as Merleau-Ponty says, the world folds up onto itself into the flesh of the, of the human. And so the human is composed of all these non-human features. So again, this is, you know, there's a whole literature about post-humanism, but for me, the importance of post-humanism is that there's lots of non-human factors that go into making the human being such that we can't say I'm a human being. Like that's some separate thing from all the factors that go into making, sustaining. You're just as much those trees that are all of that oxygen those trees are making. We breathe that in. That, those, those, that oxygen makes yeah. up the cells in your body. You are the trees. You are the dirt. You are those rocks. And then when those things all come together, you call that the human. But I mean, th there's no separate thing called human. Okay. Can I say thank you very much for, for, for that? Just one other yeah. thing is that, is that I think this, um, I can see the connection between what we've been talking about this afternoon and, and your work on migration, um, because I am very conscious that my material well-being is dependent on the active immiseration of others. So when we see migrants coming, as it is for us, we get lots of views of migrants coming across the channel in dangerous dinghies. And uh, that's, yeah, they're keeping my comfort up, you know, <laughs> I can do it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, yeah. So, thank you very much. for your. your yeah. Comments. Thanks for your questions. Are there, yeah. Great questions. Yeah. Sorry, there is a question from the uh, stream, a question from YouTube. If as a greenie, I am fighting to conserve forests and move to biopackaging and renewable energy and rewilding agricultural land, am I not already moving to more dissipative ecosystems? Yes. Yeah, the short answer is yes, <laughs> uh, because because what those activities are, they're not actually conserving energy. All of those activities, those are all great activities because they are increasing dissipation. Um, I mean, the packaging, I'm not really sure, but maybe there's some degree that's increased. But the re rewilding agricultural places, that's not that's not conserving energy by making more life. You're increasing death. Uh, it's just the other side of things, but it's an important, it's a, it's an, it might sound like just a semantic issue of like, oh, we call it conserving, you're calling it dissipation. Um, it's not just semantic because what's really going on is dissipation. The, con the conservation narrative is only successful in a Euro Western culture that has accepted a long metaphysical legacy of life and life centrism of kind of biocentrism that we're trying to conserve and preserve life and that we're, the world and human culture and civilization is about accumulation of life. Um, it is really, and in that way, a kind of negation of death. Now, not all cultures are like that. Um, they have really, and I'm trying to say that many of those other cultures that do not have such a life-centric perspective do not think about this in a Western conservation narrative. That's not a universal narrative of, of relating to nature. Uh, many people have not never thought about this as conservation. Lots of indigenous people have they think about it truly as reciprocity um, or generosity, even of 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 giving, of extend, of using and expending. Um, it's not a question of conserving or hoarding or accumulation. It's a question of relating to 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 death in an, in a very different way. Um, accepting our uh, accepting our relationship to that larger process and facilitating it. So you can call it conservation, but I worry that our narrative about conservation is actually distorting and confusing us about what we're really doing. So we think that we're like, oh, I'm not using that much energy. My footprint is really low. But the point is not necessarily to lower an energy footprint. I mean, it might be a natural consequence. Uh, and many of the things that one does like compost um, or rewild agricultural areas um, or renewable energy. Yeah, okay, renewable energy. But the energy usage is not the primary thing. The primary thing is now if you said, oh, well, we built in order to build a bunch of wind turbines, we went out and clear cutted, you know, like uh, millions of acres of old growth forest. I'm using I'm using energy. I'm like using renewable energy. Is that OK? 
No, it's not okay. Cause it wasn't about, you'd be like, well, I didn't, I conserved by using renewable energy. Yes. But the point was, is that you destroyed the trees, which were the conditions. They use way more energy than a wind turbine. They are the most energy efficient systems on the planet. 1% is what they only retain for themselves. Anyway, my point is yes to the question. You are engaged in dissipation, but for, there's a narrative calling it conservation that could lead to some contradictions. Uh, in the cases you mentioned, maybe there aren't uh, necessarily any, but in other cases, one could end up causing uh, like deforesting in the name of conservation or something like that. You might actually end up destroying dissipative systems uh, by trying to conserve them uh, if you thought you were by cons conservation you were accumulating. I mean, arguably what's going on on the planet is the conservation of energy. Like climate change is conserving insofar as it's reducing global energy usage. Like even though human energy usage has gone up, planetary energy usage has been cut in half. We have reduced the planetary energy usage by half. But that's the problem. When you reduce the energy of the planet is using by half, you've destroyed all of its mech or half of its mechanisms for sustaining itself. You've just like completely kicked out the lungs of the planet, the arms of the planet, all the things that make the planet metastable, you destroy half of those. But so we're bit, we've been looking at like, oh, look how much energy humans are using. We should be looking at, look how much energy the planet is using. That's the key point, not how much energy, how much, what's my footprint? What's your footprint? Like, how do we reduce our energy consumption? That's not, that, that's related, but it's not the key central point that we should be thinking about. We should be thinking about the biggest picture, which is planetary energy usage. How is what you're doing increasing or decreasing planetary energy usage? Okay, anybody else? If, um, if yeah, I, sure. of course. okay, um, a couple of points actually. What one is, um, uh, I've read a lot of John, um, John Foster at Bellamy, um. To make the question short, is is he um is he helping or is he hindering with his? <laughs> <laughs> I like John Foster a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I like I like his work. I think yeah. he's I think his what he's doing with Marx is definitely on the I mean on the level of Marxism. I like his approach and 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 reading to Marx. I especially think he's one of the few Marxists who takes seriously the influence of Lucretius and Epicurus on Marx's materialism. Wow. Yeah. So he ends up understanding Marx from a really different starting point than many Marxists do, partly because of where he starts um, and his motivations, because they're ecological. Uh, he ends up thinking about uh, materialism from a kind of a fundamentally ecological perspective. And I think that's I think that's right. Um, and thinking about Marx, especially in terms of metabolism, that mm -hmm. to me, like he thinks about Marx in a very similar way as I do, which is as a naturalist, like he's a naturalist materialist philosopher. And that is a really important starting point that not, a, I mean, not, there are plenty of Marxists who are very anthropocentric, um, who do not start from Marx as a naturalist. They just treat him as a humanist, despite the fact that Marx is very clear that naturalism for him is humanism. He identifies those strictly in the manuscripts. Humanism is naturalism. I mean, that's because the, there, are, there are metabolic systems and that's what nature is doing. Like that's what communism is. Communism is naturalism as humanism. That's exactly what he says in the manuscripts. It is the way in which humans participate in the metabolic systems of the planet, of themselves, as social systems. It's a social me metabolism in nested inside of a natural metabolism, and that, which is to say an ecological metabolism. And Marx gets that basic idea, um, anyway, not to go too far down this rabbit hole, but Marx gets this idea of metabolism um, from uh, an earlier term from the dissertation called Zusammenhängen in German means like to hang together. And he uses this term, you know, in a technical way that's important. It's a relational kind of naturalism. Nature is always sort of related and affecting itself such that uh, once you get to uh, metabolism, it's a metabolism is a term that he sort of comes to a bit later uh, after the dissertation that that is a way of thinking about relationality uh, in a very similar way. And he uses the terms often relatedly and interchangeably. Uh, but that's what he's, that's what, that's what Marx is dealing with. And I think, I think, I think John, uh, uh, Bellamy Foster really, I think he sees that and he's coming at Marx from that kind of embedded metabolic relational perspective. And he sees that that's part of Marx's naturalism that he gets from 
uh, Greek Greek materialism. Yeah. The other bit of the question is a little bit of a maybe slightly off the track, but I, I, I keep my mind keeps being drawn to that logo, which I think is a snake swallowing its tail. <sighs> but it's, it's very much like a Zen, um, th- a symbol that Zen, Zen people use a lot. And on the general matter of everything being in motion, um, probably part of Buddhism is is the dependent origin theory, contingency. Um, and I see, I'm just wondering how the two can tie up. Uh, you're, 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 um, I think you're, that point, that's, that's, that's the point that I most often hear from Buddhists actually is uh, yeah. the, the, the inter- interdependent origination. And I yeah. think that part, that part of Buddhism, I think that's a, that's a totally appropriate connection. It makes sense to me. I think it's, that's what's going on. I agree. I think that's an accurate statement about what's going on in the universe. Just even from a physical perspective, that's what, that's what quantum entanglement is about. It, it's a relational, it's just a relate a physically relational world. Everything is interdependently uh or originated. So yeah. Other parts of Buddhism and other types of Buddhism might diverge, but I think that's a very core idea that um is is is, is important. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, anybody else with some more questions? You can also type them in. Um, Zach, you can check in the uh, stream if you want to. Oh uh, yeah, there's no there's no questions there. Uh, okay. Um, if there is still time, I have just one tiny question. Uh, in order to make this difference not merely uh, semantic, but uh, a, a difference of substance, um, when you talked about you know cons- conservation of forests, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, recycling uh, uh, as a way of contributing to dissipation, and um, essentially not uh, a sub- uh, 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 not a matter uh, uh, not being a matter of conservation in the wider picture you're presenting. Uh, practically, what can we do? So uh, it occurred to me that, you know, reading ourselves of this logic, this reasoning, this slogan of, you know, reduce your carbon footprints, reduce your carb- carbon f- footprints does shift uh, uh, the perspective and perhaps helps approaching the problem in a different way so uh, obviously it's not just a different of a uh, difference of semantics but there is some something essentially changing the perspective in how we act as activists as well uh, uh, in relation to the climate crisis um, so I get that that uh, that's uh, actually very illuminating. Thanks for that. And uh, now a, a, a very banal question, actually. Um, since you can, uh, for example, uh, uh, approach, tackle uh, this logic of this false logic of um, uh, co- uh, conservation and reducing footprints, print, uh, footprints through means such as uh, carbon, uh, carbon p- capturing and you know, recycling of uh, carbon. So you're not fixated. Uh, this is now a big program in the European Union. You're not fixated on reducing the footprints. Uh, you uh, now the entire investment and focus in, is on capturing uh, a carbon and recycling it. So in uh, relation to waste, apart from composting, uh, what else can we do? Because you said we should not be Bury, uh, burying our uh, waste, we should be letting it decay. So well, obviously much of it is toxic, we cannot let it decay. So what do we let decay and in what form? Uh, and I'm talking, uh, so this is a very, you know, like a practical question to you. Yeah, well, I mean, as there's lots of practical answers to that, to the waste problem, uh, some of those just like just totally we need to transform the uh, the 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 process of how what we like first of all where we get the waste how we you know how much of it we use but also 
uh, what happens to it afterwards. There's, I mean, there's ways to break down. Like I was told you, there's there's bacteria and fungus that can break down lots of different things that normally would have, would be toxic. What you do is like you just you have a special place where you you you. If we still use those things, there are ways to break those down. Everything will be broken down eventually. Almost everything can be broken down in ways that we've only like. I wish the funding was there to support research for all of like the different chem plastics and toxic stuff that can be broken down with various different bacteria and fungus, but we just need to find those combinations. And that would be, that would be helpful. Obviously um, there's other things as well, but um, I think that our orientation, it, may, it, it comes like of the, the narrative of conservation, it comes from a very anthropocentric perspective of like, how do we reduce our, energy or something like that. It's like, look, that's, this is not a human centric problem. This is a glow. This is a planetary situation that we are in. If you only think about it from your own perspective of like, oh, how much energy are humans using? You're missing the bigger picture. Anyway, practical things uh, do involve, look, the number one practical thing is planting trees. Carbon sequestration, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, there's all kinds of technological solutions to capture some carbon, but like trees capture tons of carbon. And they do, it's not just about capturing carbon. Again, the idea of capturing carbon, it's a very, it's, I'm not saying it's unimportant or that we shouldn't do it. I'm just saying it's a very narrow perspective on a planetary. The question is never and is not, and it should be, how do we increase planetary dissipation? I really think that you're going to get a different set of outcomes and orientations if you ask that question. And instead of saying like, how do we capture carbon? That's a very narrow perspective. And you might get all kinds of ridiculous answers that are very technological solutions that it would be way better to just plant the tree that's going to capture the carbon, support ecosystems, support species diversity. Does ca carbon capture in like tubes do all of that? No, it doesn't because trees do it way better and they do lots of other things in addition. So cap capturing carbon as if that was the mark of the solu solving the problem it's not unimportant. I say, yes, capturing carbon, that's capturing carbon. That's great. But like, there are ways to do it that increase planetary dissipation. And there are ways that don't, we need to look at the ways that do. And the simplest way is just increasing the number of trees on the planet. It is not a technology that we need to manufacture by extraction. It's just seeds that we need to plant in the ground to grow trees that are going to repopulate the whole, the, the, you know, the, 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 the whole ecological system because planting trees. Yeah. It's, it's not just about capturing carbon. Trees are not just carbon capturers. Trees are organisms that support all kinds of other organisms. Um, so anyway, I, 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 it seems to me that so many solutions to climate change are very narrowly construed and they're very anthropocentric. They come from an anthropocentric perspective, even if they're in the name of saving the planet. It's like, again, the Anthropocene, humans saving the planet. Look, can we just get over our hubris for five minutes to realize that humans don't necessarily have the best perspective on how to save the planet? Maybe there are wiser organisms on this planet that are that are big, that can save it, and it involves nothing of our intellect, nothing of capitalism, nothing of technology. We just can't admit that the solution is not human. That that's the answer is that like, it's, it's not like, what can we do? Oh, what new technologies? How can we reduce blah, blah, blah with new technologies of green tech? No, the green technologies, new capitalist forms of environmental yeah. sustainability. It's all, it's, it's from the wrong starting point. It might have some good consequences, but they're going to be small and marginal and they're missing the bigger picture. The bigger picture is planetary dissipation. And trees in the sense that like, I keep saying that trees are wise, but I mean that in a materialist sense. <laughs> Their wisdom is that they are 300 million years old. They've been around. They know what to do. They know how to live on this planet in ways that so many other organisms don't and that have gone extinct. We are a blip on their radar. They, I'm sure, feel that we are like just absolute idiots for what we're doing, um, in part because we're destroying them. They're like, no, this is how the system works. Like, you need trees on this planet if you want life. It's gonna, that's just how it has, that's just how it is. Sorry, humans, none of your technologies and all of your eco whatevers, they're not gonna cut it. Um, you actually need non-humans to participate in this process. Perfect, thanks. Um, one final question before we end. Uh, 
Okay. So I think we can uh, close the session for today. Um, uh, uh, Thomas is going to teach in the next semester uh, on um, uh, on a topic which is uh, which sounds more or less like this title, right? So, will it be mostly this material or something from your forthcoming book? Or it'll be a mix of different things, but oh, it'll okay. be it'll be some some uh, some material on climate change, uh, on Earth systems, Gaia theory, but also some philosophy stuff, Bataille, mm -hmm. uh, Lucretius, Marx, um, so along with kind of just kind of thinking of thinking about uh, kind of naturalism and yeah, mm -hmm. climate change and and death as well. Those are really important ideas for Lucretius and Marx and Bataille. Mm -hmm. Um, our death. So death is a very, it's an important theme. And uh, the Euro Western tradition has a pretty, uh, a pretty terrible relationship to death and dissipation um, that I think that there's some thinkers within it that are helpful for getting us out of it. I'm really curious about that because my PhD was on notions of death in Greek philosophy and tragedy. So <laughs> it, will be, <laughs> it will be fun. Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, great. Thanks a lot for the great uh, lecture. Um, thanks everybody for participating here in the Zoom or uh, on the stream. Um, uh, so the, the 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 enrollments are still open until the end of the month. Uh, so if you're curious, you know, to learn more about we uh, about what uh, Thomas talked talked about this evening and also about the post uh, and see what sorts of uh, conversations discussions that can uh, can occur from uh, his uh, talks uh, feel free to um, check out the call and enroll hopefully or at least audit so um gregor claps uh, bravo from ljubljana uh, so okay so uh, this is it for this evening thanks a lot so much again uh, to you thomas and to everybody uh, else in the zoom room and on, on the stream and hi vera and thanks for the message we'll talk later vera bullman says that. so uh okay so uh thanks to everybody and see you in the next open seminar in a week or so from now. Okay, thanks, bye. Thanks, Katarina, thanks everybody.